Hello, and welcome to your very own Survivor's Guide to Health. We know how hard it is to find good news these days. It comes at a price, too. Studies show that bad news can amp up your stress hormones, increase your depression, and cause you to be less kind to the people around you. In some cases, it can even increase rates of crime and suicide in your community. At Survivor's Guide to Hell, we want to help you breathe easier. Each week, we select a difficult topic, then use that topic to help you laugh, help you find a bright side, or even just change your perspective for the better. Today, our unpleasant topic is... Disaster. You probably know what it's like to feel devastated in the wake of a disaster. Today, we have some stories and advice to help you triumph over your next catastrophe. Let's do this. I always try to turn every disaster into an opportunity, said John D. Rockefeller. If we lose our hope, that's the real disaster, said the Dalai Lama. Disasters are divine intervention in disguise, said someone whose name I don't know. What? Ever, says PJ Aubrey. Easy for you to friggin' say? The Dalai Lama, Mr. Rockefeller, and maybe even the divine intervention guy are right. Absolutely. But when you get into a true disaster, cliché quotes like these can have a really strange way of making you want to join a fight club just so you can punch someone in the face without getting arrested for it. Is that too aggressive? Let's try a different approach today. Instead of inspirational quotes and hallmark platitudes, I've got a couple stories that may help you cope with your own disasters. First, we'll share the story of a man who experienced the disaster of losing a child and what a complete stranger did to help him heal. We'll also hear the story of one of my role models and how he reacted when his personal aggressor faced a staggering tragedy of his own. Sandwiched between the two, we'll offer some legit science-backed advice on how to build resilience and stand up to whatever disaster may be coming your way. Grab your tinfoil hats, a first aid kit, and a box of tissues, everyone. Let's jump into disaster. Act 1. Abby Connor. How her death saved lives, and how her father reacted. The first time Abby Connor made it to the newspapers was because of an inexplicable tragedy that had targeted her at a Cancun beach resort. It was winter break, and the family had rented two rooms at a Mexican hotel that was crowned in palm trees. One room for 20-year-old Abby and 22-year-old Austin, and the other for their mother and stepfather, Ginny and Bill. The family of four had just arrived at the resort, and while Bill and Ginny discussed their plans for dinner, the two college kids were visiting the pool outside. Abby and Austin wanted to enjoy a few drinks at the swim-up bar to celebrate the completion of winter finals, and they had agreed to meet their parents in the lobby at 7 o'clock to finalize their dinner plans. Seven came. Then seven went. Ginny and Bill waited for their kids in the lobby, but no one showed up. Of course, Abby and Austin were young adults caught up in a celebration, so a little tardiness wasn't a surprise. The couple waited 15 minutes, then a half hour. Maybe the kids were confused because of the time difference between Mexico and their home in Wisconsin? Ginny approached the attendant at the front desk and requested that the staff contact the kids' room for them. For a moment, the attendant simply stared back at her, an unsettled look painting her face. You need to get your husband, she said to Ginny. Hurry, there's been an accident. What Ginny and Bill didn't know was that, while they had been contemplating food choices and exploring their hotel room, their kids had been discovered drifting, face down in the hotel pool. Austin had a golf ball-sized bump on his head, and Abby had a cracked collarbone. They'd both been transported to a hospital. The parents hastened to where their children were being kept, and the doctors were able to tell them some good news. Even though Austin had a concussion, he was conscious, and his prognosis was good. Abby, however, had a much different outlook. Her brain was swelling, and it had been deprived of oxygen for too long. There wasn't enough activity in her cerebral tissues to hope for her survival. 
Abby was transported to a hospital in Florida, where doctors confirmed that the young woman would never wake up. On January 12, 2017, the family withdrew her from life support. It was difficult to believe how quickly the Connors Cancun trip had become a disaster. They hadn't been at the resort for two hours before the tragedy claimed their daughter and had nearly taken their son with her. Bill and Ginny hadn't even shared a meal together before both of their children were being plugged into a hospital room, with one destined not to return alive. The surviving family was brimming with inquiry. How could both of their kids be found drowning in chest-deep water when Austin and Abby were both strong swimmers? How had the college students acquired the concussion and cracked collarbone? Where were the witnesses? In the wake of so many real questions, Austin couldn't remember enough of the evening to offer any real answers. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reports, The last thing Austin remembers was talking to a couple at the bar. There was a group of young guys around as well, doing flips into the pool and drinking. When they invited him and Abby to join in the group and doing a shot, they all drank one together. And that was it. A rash of news reports sprang up around the event, like fruit flies hovering around rotting food. They reported that numerous Mexico getaways, including Ibarostar Paraiso del Mar, where Abby had checked in, had been caught serving tainted alcohol. Newspapers weren't the only one voicing their concerns. The U.S. Department of State updated their webpage to caution travelers visiting Mexico. If you choose to drink alcohol, the department warns, it is important to do so in moderation and to stop and seek medical attention if you begin to feel ill. There have been reports of individuals falling ill or blacking out after consuming unregulated alcohol. So it was that the second time Abby Connor made it to the newspapers, it was because Bill and Ginny opened up a lawsuit against the resort. They hoped an investigation would procure some answers, and almost certainly hoped it would win them some closure as well. Nearly 100 gallons of alcohol were seized from the resort and found to contain numerous unregulated substances such as methanol, a chemical used to make formaldehyde, windshield washer fluid, and industrial adhesives. The more the family learned, the more their suspicions directed towards the tainted alcohol. However, even as other vacationers were falling critically and mysteriously ill at similar resorts, some even dying, answers remained scarce. Bad booze could not explain everything that had happened to Abby. One can only imagine how Jenny and Bill must have felt. Before Mexico, they lived in a life that was at least somewhat orderly. Like most of us, they probably believed that if you had kids, you could keep them safe by hiring the right babysitters, giving them wholesome foods, and teaching them principles of safety and integrity. When they were old enough, you called to check in on them and invited them to join you on special occasions. Even if they strayed into bad choices, you could usually see the consequences coming from a mile away. In general, if you did things right, everything would be more or less okay. Now, as Abby's father, Bill found himself in a world where his children could be abruptly taken from him. And not because he was being irresponsible, abusive, or callous. He'd simply left two adults together at a pool in Cancun, and one of them died. Several doctors had examined her, and an investigation was brewing, but Bill still had no answers. Suddenly, he was a hostage in a reality that didn't make sense. Not only that, but it was a reality without Abby. Like most people confronted with disaster, the bereaved father was forced to a juncture in his life. He could numb himself with distractions or allow his pain to fuel his pursuit of a higher purpose. Bill chose the latter. He hit the maps and designed a route from his home in Madison, Wisconsin to Fort Lauderdale in Florida, where his daughter had passed away. If he left home and drove to his destination, it would take him over 23 hours. However, sitting behind his steering wheel wasn't Bill's plan. Instead, he loaded up a bicycle with packs and water bottles, plus a sign with Abby on the back, and started pedaling. This trip would be closer to the tune of 133 hours, rest breaks not included. 
Bill was on a campaign now, thanks to a decision Abby made when she was 16. Because she had agreed to be an organ donor, four people's lives had vastly improved and extended after her passing. If there could possibly be a silver lining to Abby's sudden death, that was it. Bill adopted that silver lining like it was a pocket of oxygen at the bottom of the ocean. His 2,600 plus mile journey was designed to raise awareness for organ donations, and as the 60-year-old father peddled from state to state, his goals were coming to fruition. Tens of thousands of people were signing up to be organ donors after hearing Bill's story. And when NBA player Rex Chapman tweeted about his pilgrimage, the tweet got over 2 million views in three days. Meanwhile, the clinic that had stewardship of Abby's body reached out to the four people who had received her organs. Only one responded, Lamont Jack, the man who had received Abby's heart. When Bill was contacted with the opportunity to meet Lamont, he nearly turned it down. I almost wasn't going to stop for that get-together with Lamont. What changed my mind was finally wrapping my head around the fact that the young man is alive because of my daughter's heart, said Bill. Truer words couldn't be said. Like Abby, Lamont was a 20-year-old college junior. He had recently been sent to surgery to receive a new valve for his failing heart, but it could only buy him about 10 more days on Earth. However, when the organs of a new donor suddenly became available, Lamont left the operating room with Abby's heart instead. Now it was June 18th, 2007. Father's Day of all days. Bill stood on the sidewalk of a lush green park, clothed in his black and green cycling uniform. People with cameras had shown up and pointed them at Bill as a young man dressed in his Sunday best pulled up, stepped out of his car, and approached the waiting cyclist. At first, no words were spoken. The two simply embraced. They embraced for a long time. It was an out-of-body experience, Bill said. When the hug was over, Lamont introduced Bill to his family, who all offered their own grateful hugs. Many eyes were already brimming with tears, but when Lamont returned to his car to retrieve two gifts, the waterworks really began. In the young boy's hands were two items. A gift bag Lamont had brought Bill for Father's Day and a gift from the clinic responsible for Abby's body. The third time Abby Connor made it to the news is because of what happened next. Ah, dude, Bill said in a croaky, tear-filled voice as Lamont handed him the gift bag and said, Happy Father's Day. Then, Lamont offered him the gift from the clinic. A stethoscope. He extended it to Bill, but Bill didn't take it. The father was too busy, wiping his eyes and struggling to regain control of his breath. While Bill fought for composure, Lamont busied himself unfastening the first few buttons of his shirt, and finally, Bill took the stethoscope. Anyone know where to put this? He joked between sniffles, moving the device around Lamont's chest. Then he softly said, There it goes. Bill closed his eyes, his face to the Louisiana ground, and shook gently as his daughter's living heart beat in his ears. After a few moments, he removed the stethoscope, smiling. Well, he said, it's working. You could say Bill's cycling trip was a success. The video of Bill and Lamont's meeting reached thousands of people. To ice the cake, when David Muir from ABC News made Bill and his daughter Persons of the Week, the story went downright viral. All told, it's estimated that Bill's ride may have helped save and improve some 240,000 lives. Now that Bill has parked his bike and has been sleeping in his own bed, there's been some discussion of a book about his story, as well as a movie that could figuratively and literally touch the hearts of countless more. It's strange to think that one disastrous trip, something as ultimate and as tragic as a young life lost, has saved the lives of untold amounts of people. It definitely makes Abby's death seem a little less final. I discussed organ donation with both of my kids, Phil said. I was an organ donor myself. 
Before they got their driver's licenses, I told them I thought it was important to give back to the community, and they both signed up then to become organ donors. Obviously, the way Abby left us wasn't her choice, but given the number of things she's done through her organ donations, the people she's actually helped, it took a lot of the sting out of my own grief. You have to find the positives with this kind of stuff. I wouldn't wish it on any parent, but that positive is what I focused on to get where I am today. It's a bike ride that's been heard around the world. Act two, how to triumph in times of disaster. The Connors family story illustrates much about how disaster works. For example, it shows that disasters are sudden. They're often unexpected. They have no respect for your life plans and they don't give a damn about your cravings for closure. In other words, John Rockefeller may have been right about every disaster being an opportunity, but you've got to do the opportunity part yourself. It's what Bill Connor did when he took his 2,600 mile bike ride. And it's what you can do even when the rest of the world seems out of your control. In part two of today's podcast, we're going to lay out three well-researched things you can do to prepare for disaster before it comes and to triumph when it arrives. Don't forget to stick around for part three, where we'll find out how one exceptional man reacted to his adversary when disaster struck. I think you'll be surprised by what happens. Until then, here it is, three ways to cope with disaster. Number one. Train yourself to think positive. If you've read our articles or listened to our podcast before, you won't be surprised that positive thinking is the first tip we want to share with you. Positive thinking is linked to reduced distress and depression, as well as better sleep and, of course, a more positive outlook on life. This is a killer combination when you're battling the aftermath of a disaster. Howard Ruff, an author and financial advisor, once said, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. In other words, prepare for catastrophes before they happen. For your positive thinking habits to be at their sharpest, you'll want to get started on training your brain before disaster makes a grab at you. To start practicing your positive thinking, there's a simple exercise that takes no skill, no preparation, and no money. And it can work wonders for your soul. Count your blessings. It may sound cliche, but counting your blessings has proven results. Some people like to keep a gratitude journal. Others might do better dedicating a few minutes of their morning commute to list the things in their life that they're grateful for. Either way, if you list your blessings to yourself on a regular basis, you're likely to increase personal resilience, reduce any symptoms of PTSD, boost your hope for the future, and enjoy scads of other tried and true benefits. All of these things will be useful tools in your mental toolbox when disaster bites. For more methods on DIY positivity training, check out our blog post on positive thinking. You'll find it in the show notes of this podcast. Number two, know who your friends are. You've heard it before, a healthy support system, aka friends and family who care about you and can care for you is key in overcoming tragedy. It can mean the world to have someone to bake you a casserole after surgery, someone to listen to you vent after a painful divorce, someone to take you out to dinner when you lose your job, or someone to lovingly supervise you as you consume all the wine and ice cream in your home and theirs. Having a good support system is correlated with improved coping skills, which is a must when you're facing disaster. Not having a support system, on the other hand, has a way of magnifying mental illness even if you're not experiencing disaster, you may want to check up on the relationships you already have. Plus, I mean, that's what good friends do anyway, right? Polish up on your healthy ones, be a good friend to others, and consider ways to treat or even sever the unhealthy relationships in your orbit. If you don't feel you have good friends, or you're generally not ready for relationships, don't despair. Chances are there is a support group near you to help you feel less alone in the difficulties you're facing. We've even included a link in the show notes that can direct you to some support groups to help fit your needs. You can also ask your primary care physician or your local minister for ideas. Support groups don't require you to make close personal bonds with other people, 
but they have been shown to reduce feelings of depression, isolation, and being judged. Perhaps most importantly, support groups improve the skills needed to cope with challenges. If you're not ready for even a support group, a support animal may be your ticket. Even if it's not trained and certified as an emotional support animal, having a beloved pet around the house has been correlated with lowered anxiety, depression, and loneliness. It's also been shown to improve how well a person tends to their own needs, which is easier said than done when a disaster has struck. Number three, find a sense of purpose. Part one of today's article was all about finding a sense of purpose. Many psychologists argue that living a meaningful life brings more satisfaction and self-fulfillment than living a pleasurable or comfortable life. This argument has been around since Aristotle and makes a very compelling point. Someone who relies on comfort and pleasure will inevitably be let down again and again when seeking life satisfaction. Someone who relies on meaning and purpose can find satisfaction in life no matter what happens. Bill Connor found meaning in his daughter's death by focusing on her organ donations and using that focus to inspire more people to donate. Candace Leitner, a woman who lost her daughter to a drunk driver, found solace in creating the group Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Even Viktor Frankl, an Auschwitz survivor who lost his wife, both parents, and his brother to the Holocaust, found meaning in his darkest times by engaging in purposeful work, loving his fellow man, and demonstrating courage in the face of difficulty. He would later write a best-selling book about his experiences titled Man's Search for Meaning. Maybe you've heard of it. Viktor Frankl illustrates what psychologists mean when they insist that someone with purpose can find satisfaction no matter what is taken from them. If you want to prepare yourself against disaster or overcome one you're already experiencing, finding purpose is one of your best bets. If you need help identifying a purpose, ask yourself some questions. Are there any social issues that burn you up? What can you do about them? Is there an issue related to your most recent disaster that you can do something about? Are there any volunteer opportunities near you that you can see yourself getting into? How about looking inward? Is there something about yourself you wish to improve? Is there a passion you love and a way you could contribute that passion to the world? If so, maybe now's the time to get started. There are dozens of trustworthy resources on overcoming disasters and tragedies that don't appear in this podcast alone. If you're experiencing a disaster, take heart. Keep searching for solutions. There are options out there that can help pull you from the muck, brush you off, and set you on a path to brighter days. As the saying goes, it won't be easy, but it will be worth it. Who knows? Maybe you'll end up with a story that will inspire others right here on A Survivor's Guide to Health. Let's put the episode on hold for just a moment. Having you as a listener is more of an honor than we know how to express. Seriously. We have a goal to more than double our listeners by December 31st, 2022. We're calling it Operation Positivity Poddemic. We could use a power only you all have. The power to leave a review. Just find our show at the place you get your podcasts and click the Write a Review button. The more reviews we receive, the easier it is for our new listeners to find us. Some podcast applications like Spotify don't have a place to leave reviews. If that's the case, you can always write a review on iTunes or simply hang tight for our next Positivity Poddemic shout out. Part 3. How one exceptional man reacted when disaster struck his adversary. Okay, everyone. There's something I want you to hear. Okay, so we're watching a woman walk away from a bus with a, it looks like a tire iron in her hand. She's approaching the bus again. They're, oh, she's slamming the tire iron into the side of the bus, into the driver's window. Her car and the bus are stopped at a busy intersection. There's lots of honking. And now she's going at the side mirror with her tire iron. She 
throws it in the back of her trunk, walks away, and bus driver's standing in front of her car at the intersection, calling the police, it looks like. She, she just moved the uh, car a few feet forward and hit him with her car. He looks fine, he's laying on her hood, trying to keep his composure. Yo, yo, leave him, leave him alone. Right, there's a bunch of people confronting her about that. Bus driver's still leaning on her hood. He's on the phone with dispatch. She nudges him another few feet with her car. Scary, but he's fine. All right, she just got out of her car and pushed the bus driver. She's getting back in her car. Oh, and she drove into the intersection with him on her hood. So he flew into the middle of the intersection. He's standing up, he's okay. For the original video, you can visit our website. Most accounts label this incident as road rage, so we can reasonably assume that this woman began her fit of violence after she felt the Greyhound driver had wronged her on the road. I think it's fair to say, and the police seem to agree, that this was the wrong way to react. But I think there's another reaction here that's wrong. Predictably, this video went viral. It was covered by dozens of news stations that featured the woman's image, as well as her first and last name. It webbed throughout Facebook and soon became a feature of what many YouTubers call public freakout compilations. If you haven't seen these public freakout compilations, I gotta tell you that I don't recommend them. They're one of those things that dampens your faith in humanity, and not just because you're seeing a parade of grown people throwing tantrums over things like bad service at McDonald's or a parking spot that was perceived to be stolen from them. What really makes my soul feel like a used dish rag are the commentators. You'll often hear them give a synopsis at the beginning of each clip, explaining precisely why the person in the video is an idiotic insult to humanity. Their commentary is often exaggerated and political, and it's never, never compassionate. When I see these videos, I don't see idiotic insults to humanity. I see people struggling with mental health challenges. I see people who were once just little kids, growing up in families that reacted to their mistakes with anger, insults, and even violence, teaching them to do the same when they became adults. I see people that could use some social coaching, a lot of love, and a healthy dose of patience and compassion, not an exhibition of public shame. Now, the woman who vandalized the bus has had her public exhibition. People from all over the world have scowled at her and left their screens feeling like superior human beings in comparison. Little do most of them know that she suffers from schizophrenia. When the 20-year-old sat next to her mother during her court proceeding and saw the video, she wept. Her uncle informed the judge that the woman had not been on her pills at the time that she attacked. The YouTubers who create these compilations and the unstable people they feature in their videos actually have a lot in common. They both deal with perceived injustice by insulting the offending party and trying to tear them down. The people having meltdowns in the videos try to grab attention by shouting, swearing, and making a commotion. The YouTubers try to grab attention by sharing their content with thousands of people, still shouting, swearing, and making a commotion, but digitally. Conflict resolution, it would seem, has turned into a disaster. That's why this next story, a story absolutely riddled with its own conflicts and two major disasters, is such a shiny silver lining. Where a woman pummeling a tire iron through a bus window is one extreme reaction to conflict, this story represents another kind of extreme. The kind of extreme that makes my soul feel like fresh laundry again. To begin our story, 
I want to introduce you to my grandfather. He goes by Papa Bart, and ever since I've known him, he's been a businessman and a natural salesperson. It's proven to be a lucrative combination for him, but as any entrepreneur will tell you, there's plenty of risk in the business of doing business. In the year 2000, that risk was turning out to be a bona fide disaster for Papa Bart. Okay, so really quick, I need to offer an apology to my listeners and to Papa Bart. We had a little bit of recording difficulty that I didn't pick up during our interview, so there's going to be some parts that might sound a little glitchy. Um, many years ago, and I like to say it's a previous life, because anything for me more than 10 years ago was a previous life, I was working for a small company. I was the sales manager for that company. We had four or five salespeople. And uh, it was a national a scope, so we would travel quite a bit to call on our, our prospects. However, there was a bit of an issue. Papa Bart and the owner of the company, a man we'll call Dylan, had different philosophies on sales and marketing. According to Bart, it was getting to the point where arguments were starting to break out between the two. He, you know, he had the right to decide what he wants to do for the company, but he would change something that we had agreed upon earlier then he would change it at the last minute. And it was really awkward to tell a customer that, well, we're not going to do that anymore. Bart made the big decision. He was going to leave the company. It seemed to come as a surprise to Dylan, but according to Papa Bart... I thought everything was said and done. I can imagine a younger version of my grandfather, enjoying a little extra time with his much younger grandkiddos, hitting the highway for some extra road trips on his beloved Harley-Davidson, and tweaking his plans for his next business venture. About four weeks passed after Papa Bart had left his turbulent old job. But then, the first disaster of our story reared its slimy head. I, I get a, um, a service, and that means on a Sunday afternoon about 2 o'clock, a guy with a badge comes up to your front door and hands you an envelope and you have to sign for it. And in the envelope are the documents from a court that saying you're being sued and all the details of, of the claim and what you have to do next and, and when. So that was kind of a <laughs> awkward Sunday afternoon. I was totally surprised. And then from there I tried to figure out, well, what do I do next? Because I'd never been sued before. The lawsuit was courtesy of Dylan. Bart's ex-employer. He was making claims that Papa Bart had done several things to violate the non-compete agreement he'd signed. I was not doing those things. Uh, in my heart, I wasn't doing them, and legally, I was not doing them either. There were probably, I would say, half of the other people that worked there that either had or were having lawsuit issues with this business owner. So I thought, hey, that's par for the course. And my neighbor was an attorney. So I talked to him and he said, yeah, I can help you out. Now he was fairly new, a young attorney. And he was gonna do me a real good deal, hardly any money. And so we did all this preparation work and went through all the records and documents and everything. And we go to our first hearing with uh, my former boss's attorney and we didn't do very well. Bart's experience with Dylan, from before he'd quit to the moment a police officer knocked on his front door, was turning into a many-faced disaster indeed. His relationship with his ex-boss was a disaster. His old job was now a confirmed disaster. And the next few months of his life were threatening to become disasters themselves especially when the phone calls began coming. There were actually threats made from the former employer against me. One was that um, they were ag uh, aggressively suing me, that they would take my house, I wouldn't have a car. So those were financial threats. They're also physical threats of getting essentially beat up. So. They, so they were scary threats. 
Papa Bart told me there were even indirect threats involving his children. I've tried to piece together in my imagination what it might have been like for Papa Bart. He's in his office. He can hear his spouse moving about the nearby room. Maybe the AC kicks on or a television switches to Grey's Anatomy. Then the typical noises of his home are drowned out by the ringing of the telephone. He glances at the caller ID, expecting perhaps a child or a friend from church is on the other line. Then he realizes it's his old workplace, the one that's suing him. This is probably important. He picks up the phone and hears a chilling message. We know people who can find you and make you wish you made better choices. I don't know precisely the words or the timing this employer-gone tormentor used to communicate the threats to my grandfather. And Papa Bart did want to point out that the threats didn't come directly from Dylan, but from others he was associated with. I do know that if things weren't a disaster before the threats, they sure were after. After his hearing had gone poorly and after the threats began to arrive, Papa Bart knew he needed something to turn the tide in his family's favor. Another neighbor of mine who knew what was going on, he said, you know, in a case like this, you just got to get the best attorney you, you can find. So I went to the big city and I checked around. I actually had to cash in uh, some of my retirement to be able to afford the attorney. But things turned around in a hurry. I mean, literally. Within a few letters and phone calls, all of a sudden, my former boss is now willing to settle for a fairly nominal amount of money. The threats stopped. The legal troubles were over, with only a small price to pay to prevent future disaster. But something about Dylan still didn't sit well with Papa Bart. I did have fears that if I was out shopping in the mall and I'd run into this guy, what would I do? Would I hide? Would I not even look at him? Would I say hi? Would I turn around? I really wasn't sure how I would handle that, and I didn't feel comfortable about that. I wanted to be whole, and I wanted to be able to look him in the eye and talk. This is the part where many of us, myself, unfortunately and wholeheartedly included, would think about finding closure through hate or revenge, even if in our heart of hearts, we know that that kind of closure doesn't exist. If Papa Bart was a YouTuber and Dylan was someone throwing a tantrum at a Wendy's, this would be the part where he'd film the whole thing while smugly saying, you're gonna go viral. However, that's not Papa Bart's style. Not at all. Rather than finding ways to validate the injustices he perceived against him, Bart made it a point to proactively forgive. It really involves some on the knees, sincere prayer to my Heavenly Father to give me the strength and the understanding that I could forgive. And I did receive the strength and the love that I was looking for. Not long after Bart had won the struggle to forgive, he received another phone call from the company. This time it wasn't from a supervisor making threats. It was from an old coworker who had some news to share about Dylan's three-year-old son. Bart had met the little boy, who we'll call Boston. Boston was known for his grin, his cheerful personality, and his love for singing and dancing. If you haven't spent much time around a naturally cheerful three-year-old, especially a dancing one, let me tell you, it's some of the best company in the world. Little Boston loved toy cars and would often fall asleep at bedtime sharing the covers with them. He was very active, almost always on the go, but the little guy had his tender moments of stillness. At Christmas, for example, he'd quietly sit to watch the family's electric train travel around and around on its track. Thanks to his ability to fall asleep anywhere, there were the other kinds of still moments, like zonking out on his dining room table in the middle of a coloring session. There was the fishing trip that would firmly place Boston in family history, when at the age of two, he caught a fish as big as himself. There were all the nights he spent watching Donnie and Marie with his family, pretending to be Donnie. Indeed, there were countless things 
that would make Boston terribly painful for his family to miss. That's why Bart's co-worker was calling. Boston had recently been found unconscious in the family pool and had passed away two days later. His obituary contained a line that no obituary ever should. Boston is survived by his parents. Papa Bart recollected the event with me. Wow. Well, I know I I just felt really sad. And I thought, how in the world would I handle something like that? Um, You know, no matter what he did in business, that's not something that should happen to anybody. So I go over to their house. He knew I was coming. And I expressed my condolences and my love. According to Papa Bart, he wouldn't have been able to do such a thing if he hadn't already done the work to forgive Dylan, especially when he offered his ex-boss a comforting embrace. It was a very uh, tender moment. I don't think he was really expecting that. I don't think it totally caught him off guard because he he reciprocated. And uh, he probably said, thank you, I appreciate that. But, you know, I don't remember the exact thing, but it wasn't uh, reticent. He didn't hold back. And I realized that had I not achieved this level of forgiveness and peace in my heart, that I could not have taken that step to try to comfort a fellow traveler here on earth, a fellow father. And to this day, I'm so glad that I was able to do that. I imagine most of us would probably feel sympathy and pain for even the most disdained characters of our past if we learned their little ones had recently been killed. However, I doubt I could do what Papa Bart did and travel to that person's home to offer love and embrace. I'm sure Dylan received many sympathetic visitors during his ultimate disaster. Some of them were probably much closer to Dylan than Papa Bart had been, However, I wonder which kind of visit would leave the brightest impact in your darkest times. Visits from someone you consider your friend, or a loving visit from someone you considered your enemy. One can't be certain about how Dylan felt towards Papa Bart during the court hearings and after the settlement, but it's reasonable to assume the feelings weren't good. In visiting Dylan after the death of his young son, perhaps Papa Bart gave him a gift far more lasting than a hug and an I'm there for you. Perhaps Papa Bart granted Dylan strength to forgive him as an ex-employee and the relief that comes from knowing that no resentment remained between himself and an old enemy. My grandfather seems to know this. As I was putting his account to words, he sent me this text. I need to add another aspect to the event. There are always two sides in any human interaction with two people. I forgave him for the wrongs he did to me. I felt slash believe he forgave me for whatever wrongs he perceived I did to him when he accepted my condolences and hugged me back, smiled, and gave appreciation for my love and concerns. That confirmation completed the peace and joy of the forgiveness process for me. And for him as well. I don't know if you could say this story had a happy ending, all things considered, but Papa Bart is right. It had a complete ending, complete with the joy of forgiveness. The loose ends of bitterness have been severed. Compassion has prevailed. It's a damn good silver lining, if you ask me. And um, maybe YouTube could take a lesson from it. That's the end of today's stories. Now, as always, we invite you to join us for our weekly Silver Liners Challenge, which is designed to be an easy, usually easy anyway, actionable step you can take to help boost your week and help you survive hell. Here it is, the Silver Liners Challenge. And this week you actually get some choices. 
so that's nice. Choice number one, work towards forgiveness for someone who's wronged you. Choice number two, think of someone who's experienced their own disaster and try to be a resource for them, even if it's only in a small way. And choice number three, mark yes to be an organ donor. Feel free to share your experiences in the comments of our website, survivorsguidetohell.com, on our Facebook page or on YouTube. If you'd like to see the videos and pictures that often accompany our episodes, like a video of Lamont and Bill having their embrace and their experience with a stethoscope, check out our website at survivorsguidetohell.com, where you'll also find a lot more information, including our storytelling code of ethics and many of the sources that we used to create today's podcast. We're always looking for cool new stories. If you have something to share, please visit our site and drop us a line. And remember, if you liked this episode, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, and many other streaming platforms. When you subscribe, you no longer have to go searching for episodes. They'll be delivered right to the place where you listen to your podcasts. Simply open the app or website you use, find our podcast, and click the subscribe button. You'll also be helping to support us as we spread our good vibes. If you like Survivor's Guide to Hell and would like to contribute some fuel for those vibes, then you're already on the right track. Just listening is the best thing you can do. We've also seen amazing results when our listeners share our episodes with others. And of course, we're going to be getting back to you on some other ways you can help us spread the positivity podemic. Anyway, if this episode makes you think of someone, send it their way. They may be grateful for it, and we will be too. Last but not least, our cheesy joke of the week. Okay, it took me forever to find this joke. It's hard to find jokes on disaster that are actually funny, so I hope you like it. My idea of starting a professional hide-and-seek tournament was a total disaster. Good players are hard to find. (laughs) Thank you, and have an excellent day.